her and, and put its nose on her heart. And so that's the, that's a good example of when when we think of something which is not our truth, which our body doesn't agree with, then there's this contraction in our bodies that feels uncomfortable and the horses want to move away from us. And when we think about something which is our truth, where we create more alignment, then, then the horse comes and wants to get really close to us because our energy feels comfortable. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Mirror in the Stall, a podcast by Confidence and Connection Coaching with Amber. On today's episode, we have Cindy Jacobs. She's the founder of Free Reign Australia, an EGALA practitioner, mind-body method coach, a certified coach in multiple brain integration. She's also a somatic experiencing practitioner, and the list goes on and on. The work she does is absolutely phenomenal, and I hope you guys enjoyed this episode as much as I did. Okay. okay, everybody. I wanted to introduce you guys to Cindy Jacobs. She is the founder of Free Rain Australia, and we had the opportunity to have a pretty incredible conversation a couple of weeks ago. And a lot of the work she does really resonates with the stuff that I do. And from our very short conversation, it helped me fill in a lot of gaps in the work that I was doing and answered a lot of questions for me. So I'm super excited to be able to have you on and share all of this goodness with everyone else. Um, So thank you so much for coming and joining us tonight. Thank you, Amber, for inviting me. Yeah, so I always start off with the same question to everybody and it is, how did you get into horses? What did that story look like for you? Well, without taking up too much time, because it's a long story, um, like a lot of little girls, probably, I was always obsessed with horses and not anything else. And uh, I grew up in Chicago. And um, so I was never even near any horses. And then when I was in my early 40s, and I'm then living in Australia, I decided that uh, I'd like to have a horse and had no idea about horses, never been around them, just decided I should have one. And a (laughs) friend of mine organized for me to have two horses. So I said, oh, okay, I'll have two. And um, at the time I was living in a little house on a normal, with a normal yard. And I said to my partner, well, you know, what are we going to do with these two horses? And he said, well, I guess we just have to get a bigger place. So we went out and we (laughs) bought a 10 acre property. And the horses were in Tasmania, which is an island, and they had to be sent over to Victoria. So they got sent over to my friends, and we had to go pick them up. And And he said, well, we need something to pick them up in. And he's like, yeah, I guess we'll have to go out and buy a horse trailer. So we did. And then he <laughs> said, you know, my car is not really big enough to tow this. So we went out and bought a bigger <laughs> car. <laughs> So, so it quickly got out of control for you. Yeah. So we ended up having, you know, we bought 10 acres. We bought a horse trailer. We bought a bigger car and we went to pick up these horses. And we had no idea, no idea <laughs> about horses. And they uh, uh, very generously put these two horses into the trailer. And then we jumped in the trailer and drove off. And we're now on this highway, which is notorious for accidents. And we're on this highway and, and we're, the trailer is lurching. And, we're, and I turned to him and I said, do, do you think this is normal? And he said, no, I don't think so. So, because we had like about a four hour drive with the car right. just lurching down the highway. <clears throat> and um, so we pulled over on this very busy highway and we thought, well, we'll just take the horses out because what else do you oh. do? <laughs> so... We took these two horses out of the horse trailer and we swapped them over and we just put them on the other side. And, and thankfully, these two horses obliged and went back in. Like there was no issue. Because <laughs> at, at the time, I thought, how hard is it? You know, you just swap them over. <laughs> you know, and there's busy traffic screaming along the highway. So we were pretty lucky. Um, 
despite our stupidity and ignorance. And we, we got these two horses home and, um, <clears throat> and it just kind of went from there. So we had two horses and I had a young son and we thought, well, we need to have three horses because then the three of us can go riding. And then we got three horses and then it was, well, the horse trailer doesn't, <laughs> doesn't pull three horses. Let's get a horse truck. So <laughs> it just kind of went on and on from there. So <clears throat> That's kind of how I got into it. And, and um, in some ways, um, I'm quite lucky in that I, I was completely green and had no, no awareness or understanding about um, horses. And so I spent a lot of time observing them and thinking about you know, how they think and what they do. And um, I accumulated a herd of horses over a short period of time because I think it's kind of a disease, you know, collecting horses. I think it should be covered under our Australian Medicare system. You know? so, so I accumulated a number of horses. And over the years, I got up to about 19 and I'm down to about 16 at the moment. And most of them are rescues. And um, At one point I accumulated, not accumulated, but I went out and bought an Andalusian stallion because you just got to have one of those. <laughs> like, not, not knowing anything about horses but for some reason they uh they had a lot of tolerance for me and um mm -hmm. and i think mainly the the reason they had tolerance for me was because i had no idea what i was doing so i had no preconceived ideas i didn't have what what you might call baggage in terms of i didn't have any expectation of how they should be and so mm -hmm. to me they were like these these beings that I'd never met before and had no idea how they were going to respond. And so I was curious about their response and I was treating them the way I wanted to be treated. So um, in, in a lot of ways, they, they, I, I was able to learn a lot about their behavior because I didn't have that, that extra filter that we sometimes put in the way I work with, um, you know, I'm now working in uh, with people who have trauma and um, and so some people are equestrians and when they come to work with me, you know, it's really challenging because I went down that path too when I did my equine therapy training where, you know, you just have to like shelve everything you know about horses and like, because it gets in the way, it really gets in the way of who is this being that I'm dealing with and, and you miss so much of the subtle uh, communication that the horses are offering because we're interpreting all the time and we already have an expectation and um, one of the funny things that I'm pretty sure my horses teach me is that whenever I predict they're going to do something they do the opposite and without <laughs> fail and then I try to get really clever and do reverse psychology on them and they go uh -uh, you know <laughs> we're on to you so that doesn't work either. So they're already ahead in terms of knowing what we're thinking. Like it's instant and whatever thought we have, it's instant that, you know, they're picking up on it. So I can't trick them. <laughs> so, right. so yeah, basically that's how I got into horses. I mean, that's, that's how I got started in horses anyway. <laughs> and, yeah. And uh, I know I, in chat you had said that you, what were you doing prior to integrating the horses into you, what your program now? And how did that story kind of go where you decided, oh, you know what, like, actually, <laughs> these could be useful for us? Well, I had this accident once with this horse that really um, uh, helped me think differently about them. Um, at the time, I didn't know that she was dissociated. Uh, you know, where lights are on, nobody's home kind of look, you know, just not there. And I just, I just thought she had no personality. And right. she, she was my partner's horse. And, and uh, one, one day after we had rain for like three months uh, straight, which is unusual for Australia. But anyway, we had all this rain, and uh, it had cleared and we went out to visit the horses. And she touched an electric fence and of course she got a, a bit of a charge and she, she ran, she spun around and ran away from, from the fence. And I was about 30 yards away and she literally ran over the top of me. And as she ran over me, she, she touched every part of my body. She ripped 
my ligament off my knee, off my elbow. Um, I put my hand on my, my chest as her hoof landed on my hand. And all I kept, kept thinking was, you know, not the boob, not the boob. And so <laughs> she, was a, she was this big quarter horse that looked like she was on steroids. She was just this massive freight train of a horse. And she put her hoof on my, my hand and she knew it was this weirdest thing that, that she knew that if she had put a weight on me that she would have just punctured my lungs and probably would have killed me. And I knew that she knew and she knew that I knew. Like it was this instant knowing between us. And so she shifted her weight off my chest and kicked me in the face instead. <laughs> and, okay. and so <clears throat> um, I didn't really have any injuries, just some torn ligaments. Anyway, I, I went to the hospital and came back later that afternoon. And she was standing with a couple of other horses in the far corner of the arena. And I walked up to the fence and she left those other horses and ran straight over to me. And it was like she just checked me up and down. And, and she, and I don't know how I knew this, but she was just saying, you know, thank God you're okay. The others told me I was going to be dog food. <laughs> and then... <laughs> And then she turned around and she joined the other horses. And that's the only time her personality actually came back into her body. You know, there was, there was a being inside that connected with me and checked mm -hmm. to see if I was okay. And then she went back to the other horses and then she dissociated again. And she stayed that way, dissociated. And, and it was only years later that I realized that she was dissociated and, um, mm -hmm. And it occurred to me that, you know, there are, there's a being in there that can communicate and connect with us. And, and so mm -hmm. that kind of started me on that journey. But the rest of the, the story is that, you know, I used to work in change management and I used to work with leaders, um, executives, and did, I did a bit of executive coaching. And I used to come home after working with them and, you know, I'd look around like, where'd my horses, where'd everybody go? And I quickly figured out that feeding them didn't give me leadership rights. And like everybody just disappeared. And it occurred to me also that the issues that I was having with my horses in terms of being their, their alpha, their leader, they were the same issues that my clients had, you know, how do they inspire their teams and, and um, you know, how do they perform together. And so in a similar way, I realized that, you know, I needed to develop the same leadership skills that my clients needed to develop. So there was really no difference between humans and horses. We look for the same things in leaders. We look for, um, you know, honesty and compassion and respect and integrity and, and clear communication, and consistency, like all the sort of things that we want from our leaders, you know, whether you're a horse or a human, you want the same thing. So, um, I sort of went down that track then of learning about how do I integrate working with people and horses since we're basically the same, it's just we have two legs and they have four legs and they're probably a lot smarter <laughs> than we are um, <laughs> because they, they definitely, they've been around for what, 60 million years and they don't kill each other. You know, they manage to thrive and survive, whereas, you know, we're not as good at it as they are. So there's a lot for us we could learn from them. So, yes, yeah, so then I went down that track of um, working with teams and leaders. And so I started to do group work and uh, interesting dynamics. The horses would always mirror the dynamic of the team and how functional or dysfunctional the team was. The horses would all of a sudden take on different characteristics matching the people that were there. And the other thing that happened to me was that when people came in a business and a group context, a lot of them started to go deep really fast and like get, you know, w which was not really appropriate in a business setting, but they'd get really emotional or things would start to happen for them. And then I realized that I needed to have more than coaching skills to be able to support these people. So I did my, um, I went back and studied counseling and got my counseling uh, qualification and then I did three years of trauma training because the horses kept saying not enough kept pushing me go further <laughs> so 
Um, so I've, I'm now a, a trauma counsellor and I work with my horses in, in quite a different way since then. Right. Yeah. So what is that? I know you have a couple different programs that you do. Um, what is the main thing that you work one-on-one -on -one with these or do groups more or what does that look like? Um, at the moment, I'm doing one-on-one -on -one work mostly. And, um, you know, I, I like the one-on-one -on -one work because it really goes deep and we can go as deep and far as the client wants to go. So, you know, whether it's, it's spiritual or it's uh, dealing with trauma and uh, childhood adverse experiences and um, violence or whatever it is that they want to do, you know, we can go there. So I quite, uh, I like doing that kind of work with my clients because the horses really, really are supportive. And um, um, I think when, when groups get together, humans tend to put on more of a mask, you know, in terms of emotional safety. And so, um, as you probably know, if we, if we're wearing a mask around a horse, you know, <laughs> they can get quite agitated because <laughs> they don't feel safe. It's like, well, I don't know who you really are because you're pretending to be somebody that you're not, or you you're withholding, which is often the way we just hold back when we're in a group because there's not enough emotional safety that's been established. So, you know, we tend to hold back a bit and, you know, the horses mm -hmm. will always respond to that with agitation because they don't feel safe. Mm -hmm. And right. um, not that my horses, uh, do this to anybody but me <laughs> but you know if, <laughs> if you're in that space of of um not being fully yourself or being fully authentic they tend to nip at you you know it's just like get real you know you know i'm not buying right. that get real <laughs> yeah so yeah I've, I, go ahead i definitely want to go deeper with that little nugget because i know when we first had our conversation I saw a post that I think was posted about a year ago, and I don't know why it popped up in my feed. Um, and I believe it was someone that you guys had had rolled into your herd that had cerebral palsy. And um, there was that story around how it had helped that person co-regulate their nervous system. And, and it's interesting because I always think of, you hear half of the stories of horses that are there for that. That is what they do biologically wired, you know, for their safety and to thrive is to be able to do that with people and with other horses and knowing that there's been studies around that, but then also working with clients who have horses that have behavioral issues. And so for me, there is this disconnect of, okay, I understand that maybe some horses are meant for that work and some horses are meant for this work. Um, but after our conversation, I then realized once you're aware <laughs> that that's, once they're aware that you're aware, <laughs> then there is no slack given. Um, that's right. And it's like they get to act as the mirror until you own it and then they get to start the healing process. And so that's how I started to see them that once you, they've shown you where you need to go, then they can back off and they can change the role a little bit. And then, and I think with the people with their personal horses, it's so significant because they're with them constantly. And um, we had some interesting experiences and it was directly related to me having that conversation with you because then I was able to fill in those gaps for those people um, but I would love for you to share your take on that piece because that's what was such an aha game-changing moment for me in our conversation. So I want everyone to be able to have that as well. Um, and I know you had a couple of good stories around that. So, you know, what is your take on that piece of it? Um, I think that, you know, we are unique vibrational beings that we are a composite of our thoughts, our emotions, our life experiences, our past life experiences, if you want to throw that in, our ancestral stuff, whatever, you know, everything, 
that's happened is is held vibrationally in our bodies and so we're like these little beacons that just we're, we're constantly transmitting this information and the the more uh well the the issues that that we hold that are unresolved tend to have more of a charge in our bodies and the horses are often will go to those charges first and so um, I think the most profound experience for me, like that really made me get it was I had a couple of visiting mares that um, were with my stallion. And uh, one morning, well, I, I, my former partner and I were at each other's throats a lot, you know, not that we could pinpoint a particular subject. It was just everything, <laughs> you know, we, we just, kind of had just hit that energy of just yeah having that you know at each other's throats and so one morning in particular i thought oh i'm going to go out and going to go out and enjoy my morning coffee and observe the horses and just and just kind of soak in the ambience outside and leave thinking i can leave my stuff behind which is you know we can't leave our stuff behind but i thought yeah i'll just do that and so i'm standing about um a meter or a yard away from about three feet away from these two horses. And they were, there was a fence between us and the two horses were facing me and I'm standing there quietly and they're standing there quietly and, and I'm just admiring them. And then all of a sudden for no apparent reason, one horse just lifted her foot and she kicked the other one in the throat and severed her jugular vein. And <clears throat> It looked a bit like an Alfred Hitchcock movie for the moments after that with blood spraying. And she survived because I didn't know this, that horses have two jugular veins. But at the time it was, it was a traumatic event. And um, it took me probably about 10 days to own that one. You know, I sat with that and thought, mm -hmm. why did those horses do that? You know, what was, what was in their environment that caused them to do that? And so it kind of hit me like a, ton of bricks when I went oh that was me you know my energy you know that energy of being at each other's throats that's what they picked up on and they just they respond to energy so that's what you know so that's what happened and so that my big aha moment was that that um, it's not just enough for me to have this relationship with my horses their lives literally depend on me having my stuff together and when I'm not dealing with my stuff and when I'm in denial or, you know, the usual human stuff that's in the too hard pile, I'll, I won't deal with that today. You know, no one will know <laughs> the horses you know, they, they, um, that, you know, their lives depend on me dealing with my stuff. And um, so that was a, like I said, that was a big wake up call for me. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And then, I know that you, when I did the training through Egala, that was always such a big part was that there would be such a group of people. Nobody knew each other. There was always quite a few people and nerves were kind of everywhere. It was a little bit uncomfortable and uncertain. And when they would give us activities in a group setting, if people weren't agreeing on how it should be executed, they would always draw our attention to the horses that were out in the arena and go, interesting, you guys are just going, look at the horses, look what's going on for them. And I know that you have an, um, a process that draws awareness to that and, and addresses that issue so that it doesn't become an issue. Because it did, you know, if it's not controlled at some level, even though we're all there in this training, to me, it always seemed like this is a little bit unsafe. You know, it was yes. just, a, there's a lot of people, there's chairs everywhere, there's horses that are, you know, and, and in that model, it's a little bit free in that way where they're asking you to not intervene too much. Um, but it, there was always this level of, okay, but what's safe and what's not. And I didn't know how to actually deal with that until I talked to you. <laughs> and um, so I, I would love to hear you share that bit of what you do in that process looks like so that that can kind of be resolved before you go in. Yeah, yeah, that, um, that process certainly um, without question shows people what 
energetically they're holding you know, what's going on because the horses have such a powerful response to that and I was taught in that process as well and the idea was like you know don't don't give people too much information because then you're just observing how they follow instructions and and um, just invite people just to interact with the horses so they can see what shows up and um, for me um, my horses were like hurting each other and they'd go from being calm to like killing each other when when some people entered into their space and I thought well you know I can't I can't subject my horses to that you know that they're my priority and they they're trusting me that I'm not going to put anything unsafe in their space and so um, I'm not quite sure how I came to conclude that it's about grounding people. So I do this process where we do a grounding and at the end of the grounding, it's just basically just checking in with what you can see, hear, smell, feel. Um, but the important part is to check in and notice how you are and find a word, a feeling word that describes how you are. So it could be agitated, nervous, angry, frustrated, relaxed, happy, doesn't matter. Um, and so what I noticed is that as long as we name how we are, then um, it settles us down. So let's say you're nervous and you, you name it, you know, I'm feeling a bit nervous now and I feel a bit fluttering in my stomach. And that's all you have to do and your body will settle because you've named it. But the important part is that you've contained it. It's like you've stopped it from sending it out into the environment to bounce back at you. And, you know, whether you're with horses or with humans, when, when you don't know, when you don't check in, then your subconscious is projecting out into your space how you are so that it can then bounce back. So it's like a double whammy. So if you can imagine like you're driving to work and, and there's a bit of road rage. You're pretty agitated. You get to work, you know, and you walk in the doors and people look at you and instantly go so what happened to you because you know it's because unless we name it and say i'm really agitated right now because it was it was you know a lot of road rage we just walk in and we'll bang and we just send it out into our environment and then people are agitated back at us so mm -hmm. we don't have to fix it we just name it mm -hmm. so since then i would invite people just name how you are doesn't matter you know you could be terrified you could be angry you could feel rage it does not matter for the horses they don't care as long as you name it because then you're owning it and you've contained it and uh, you know i had one lady that um there was five horses standing around her surrounding her they were only like about you know three feet away from her and did the grounding which i normally do outside the fence so i can't remember why i did it anyway <laughs> so uh, so these horses are all surrounding her and I said and so you know can you find a word or words that describe how you feel right now and she said I'm really angry and, and I said oh, okay and you know the horses are all just standing there chilling and I said so what does your body want to do and she said I want to stomp my feet and I want to punch the air I said oh okay <laughs> give that a go and so she did mm -hmm. and the horses were like yeah that's your stuff and like <laughs> they were nearly falling asleep and they were <laughs> so here's this person that feels this intense anger and she's expressing it in a in a way you know through movement and the horses were like mm -hmm. yeah whatever and that's only mm -hmm. because she owned it if people come in there and say oh i'm not angry i'm fine <laughs> then right. The horses instantly feel the agitation because like, I'm not safe. And whether you're a horse or a human, when someone does that to us, you know, our, mm -hmm. our instinct is to move away. And that's what the horses want to do is like move away from that person who's saying they're not angry because I can feel I'm getting mixed messages and I can feel there's something else there. And um, right. us humans, we tend to override that sensation and we just stand there smiling sweetly and going, oh, okay. And <laughs> I had this, um, my horses really know how to bring humility into my life. 
I was running a training program and one of the participants was doing just that, you know, I'm fine, you know, I've got this. And, and, you know, my body was saying, no, no, she doesn't. And we were just sitting in this little circle amongst the horses. And so I'm thinking, how do I address this and maintain her emotional safety and respect where she's at uh, so that she doesn't feel picked on? And I, I need to honor this. But I wasn't quick enough. You know, so here I am processing, how do I do this? And one of my horses backed into me, lifted her tail, and started to <laughs> hit on me. <laughs> So I had to jump out of the way, but then I had to own it. I had to say, yep, you know, I was full of shit. You know, I was incongruent because in that moment, <laughs> my horses were expecting me to do what a horse would do, which is either to bite her or to move away. And I overrode right. the impulse to move away and stay in that process because that's what humans do. And in that case, that was what I was supposed to do was hold that space for her, but I wasn't quick enough. And yeah, my horse <laughs> let me know it. <laughs> yeah, I, I speak a lot of, to that, mostly because after we had our conversation and I had told you, there is three horses that I have out here that one that I've known who I own for 10 years and all of them were exhibiting signs of a, like aggression when they're being brushed you know, um, they were just agitated, you know, biting, pinning their ears, grinding their teeth. And I was like, I was like, okay, well, maybe there's something going on that people always jump straight to, oh, there's a supplement you should give, or, you know, there's all these. And I was like, no, I've known that horse for a while. And I pulled him out and brushed him. He's fine. Put him in a different space, brush him everywhere. And I was like, okay. Um, and it was, clear to me in that moment that this has always been a horse that was really good at this work. I, we've used him in the gala trainings before. He was the one that could stay in all day. And I kind of just lost sight of all of that and it missed me getting all this other stuff together. And so when that was happening, I was kind of, you know, blowing it off. But then I started like, wait a minute, like, why am I blowing this off? This is ridiculous. And, um, and then the other two was the same situation. So we did a workshop and it was raining outside. And so we couldn't go out and work like we normally would. So I told them, bring your journals and we're going to go into the stalls with these horses. And um, I want you to groom them without tying them up and then let them give you feedback on how they are. And there was one person in particular who has a horse that was getting increasingly aggressive where it was coming after her. And and this was post our conversation. So I was thinking about them like, okay, you know, she's naming one thing, but the horse is still doing it. And I was like, there's something else we need to go deeper. Like the horse is telling you that's not it. There's something else. And, and we're standing in the stall and he's walking in and he does a lap and he pins his ears of both of us and walks out and he does it a couple of times. And, you know, she's going through stuff and I, you know, I kind of said, well, what is, what is he showing you? And he doesn't like me. He hates me. And I was like, interesting. So we kind of just drew on, when is the first time in your life that you felt that way? And she was like, oh. And so she sat in the stall and just journaled. The first time that you could think of that you felt that way, that you thought someone or something in your time. And while she was sat down in the stall, I was like, just don't mind him. You know, you're going to dig on this and find out what he's trying to show you because you're not there yet. And, and she was journaling. He came in and rested his nose on her head and just sat there with her while, you know, and it was just like this huge shift. And after that day, um, she had seen a video of a trainer we both follow, Warwick, and he had posted this video of a horse that he had in a clinic that was a little bit aggressive, didn't like men, and he was showing the process that he did. And she tagged me in that video and was like, I'm going to try this next time I'm out. And I was like, perfect, that's great. But the big piece for him was you have to take the emotions out of it. And, um, and she's like, that's the hard part. Right. And so she comes back out I think, a couple days later and she's like, I didn't even have to do it because he's not trying to bite me anymore. Like the problem is gone. And I was like, because we found the actual source and root of what he was trying yeah. to show you. And he's been good at since. So that was such a profound thing because it was so big and then it was just gone. And there was nothing that happened in between other than she figured out what it was he was trying to show her. And so yeah, it was such a cool. huge thing. And I was just like, yeah. mm -hmm. and I was um, there it is. Yeah. That's what she so, was talking about. 
when when a client shows up i always say to them that um they're the novelty in the horse's space and the horses are prey animals and they need to know the most subtle of shift in their environment to determine how safe they are so their number one need is always safety so um, whether it's a new client or whether it's you know work, you working with your clients your clients with their own horses you know that horse is not you know is is reading us energetically moment to moment to decide you know how safe am i right now how safe am i how safe am i it's just like when when we greet people and we say how are you we really want to know how safe am i with you like you know what's going on for you so i need to know how i can you know how i am with you and so the horses are doing the same thing and mm -hmm. if that horse is in a confined space or it's got a it's got a halter or a head stall on it and and a rope attached that horse is not free to escape. And so mm -hmm. they're reading us energetically moment to moment to decide how safe am I right now? And so it makes sense then if the horse is reading us to decide how safe it is, it makes sense that nearly all of its behavior is gonna be in response to what it's paying attention to, which is us. And so that's right. what I say when my clients show up is, I don't know how these horses are gonna be because you're the novelty in their space and their attention is on you because they need to know how safe they are around you. So it makes sense if their behaviors start, they start to do things. Well, that's interesting. I wonder what, what is it about you that they're responding to? So it's not ever about whether they like us or not. It's about how safe am I and what, what is it that you're holding and, and am I safe with you right now or not? And if you, if you name it, if you own, whatever it is that you're holding, no matter how ugly it is, it doesn't matter, then they feel safe. So we don't have to even mm -hmm. fix it. It's just like, like your client, you know, just journaling, well, what's, what's going on for me? What happened then just processing that is enough that the horse, because there's a congruence there that, you know, all mm -hmm. of a sudden the, the person's body is, is in alignment with their, their thoughts and so there's an energy flow and the horses can sense that. And of course then, you know, the body is in more of a parasympathetic response, which is that calm response and the horses feel safe. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that you bring that up about the rope because this particular horse, um, he was, he's fine to be ridden. He's great when we do round pen work but it was really when she would do the line work where she was attached to him that it would come out. And it's obviously because of the fact that he knew he couldn't get away. So his only defense instead of flight would have been to fight. I'm gonna defend myself and go into, so that's interesting. Um, yep. Interesting that that was very aligned with what they were kind of dealing with. Um, yeah. But it just um, really. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> There's a delay, go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, and so it might seem counterintuitive, but when um, when my clients enter the horse's space, I've got 16 horses that are just wandering around at liberty, and they're safer mm -hmm. because they move right. away from what's unsafe and uncomfortable, and they move towards safety and comfort. So uh, <laughs> you can actually play this little yo-yo game of, you know, going up in your head and thinking about something stressful that really annoys you or, you know, oh, I got to go, you know, whatever, got to pay that bill, you know. So you've actually disconnected from the horse and the horse moves away. And then you can just drop into your heart space, get present, start to feel gratitude for, you know, your feet on the earth and, you know, for the sun and whatever is, is in your environment right there in that moment, just tune into the environment and start to feel some gratitude because you're creating more coherence in your heart field and the horse turns around and comes back. So you can play this little yo-yo game. Um, and another thing that you can, it's almost like lie detector test with uh, one of my clients. She was, um, she was reflecting on whether she should um, take a job in Western Australia or she should stay and do her PhD. And I was observing the horse. <clears throat> And so the horse, you know, she was just standing there thinking quietly and this horse turned its back on her and walked away. And, um, and then a couple of moments later, the horse turned around and came back up to her. 
And so I said, you know, what happened for you? And she said, oh, well, I was thinking about taking that job in Western Australia and the horse moved away. And then when mm -hmm. she thought about doing her PhD, the horse came up to her and, and put its nose on her heart. And so that's, the, that's a good example of when, when we think of something which is not our truth, which our body doesn't agree with, then there's this mm -hmm. contraction in our bodies that feels uncomfortable and the horses want to move away from us. And when we think about something which is our truth, where we create more alignment, then, then the horse comes and wants to get really close to us because our energy feels comfortable. So it's a really simple lie detector test of, you know, well, what, should I take that job? Should I do this? Should I leave that relationship? And the horse, you know, our bodies are just these <laughs> beacons right. that are giving the you know that feedback yeah it feels like muscle testing we do muscle it testing is. in theta <laughs> it's exactly the same exactly yeah the same. Yeah. That's <laughs> yeah yeah that's really interesting and i know you you do um sessions with groups of people and I kind of, after I saw your stuff, I was like, oh, we should try this. Like, bring everybody out. <laughs> All these things I want to experiment with. Um, but speak a little bit about what those look like. I believe you call them the water hole sessions. Oh, those ones. Yeah. So um, I wanted to give people an opportunity to experience being in nature and experience being around the horses without really having an agenda. So I created this program once a month on Sunday morning called water hole and there is no water <laughs> or a hole, but that's kind of like hanging out at the water cooler at work. So I call it the water hole. And um, I usually have a little bit of a, a little bit of structure to it. So um, one that I, I have a lot of fun offering and offer it a couple times a year um, is to, you know, we're always, when we greet a horse, we want the horse to like us. It's just a, a human thing, you know. Oh, I want that horse to rub its head. I want that horse to really like me and connect. And, you know, of course, equestrians who may be listening know that the horse is going to go, ew, and move away because they can, they can feel the neediness. But it's just what we do. So I invite people to greet the horse and and reflect on what you can offer the horse. You know, what is it that you can give the horse, whether it's appreciation or gratitude or, you know, heart connection. So go and greet the horses and, and rather than focusing on how the horse is responding to you and what you can get, turn that around and offer that back to the horse and what, what's different. So, you know, so that's the sort of structure that I offer in these water holes. So it's not a lot. And, you know, people just spread out. They can sit on the ground, lay on the ground, hang out with the horse. They connect with the horse. So it's, it's relatively unstructured. And um, so I might leave them for 15 or 20 minutes just to hang out with the horses and, and w with some kind of a focus. And then we return back to our seats. So we sit in a circle and the circle has to be quite tight because the horses like to get in the middle of the chairs and kind of do the posy yeah. thing. <laughs> so, so then it's hard to see people when you're looking under legs and around bumps. And so we, we have a tight circle. And what, what normally happens is that when, when the group arrives, then most people, they may know each other from previous water holes, but it, most people there are don't really, you know, they don't interact outside the water hole. So, um, it's just very uh, casual. And um, mm -hmm. so when they arrive, the horses are kind of spread out and doing their thing. And then we, I usually, we do the grounding and then I might send them, I might invite them to go greet the horses, and just notice what you notice, then come back. And then we do a little debrief, anything you want to share and send them out again with a bit more focus. So they might go out to the horses three times and, and come back to the chairs. And by the end, the horses have all gathered around us. So it's quite crowded, you know, but, and, and so it shows that, you know, there's been a shift in, in the energy of the group, that people are feeling safer, calmer. There is more unity within the group. There is more shared experience amongst the people there. 
And so you can see the shift in the horses, how they come in and they hanging out over the chairs or they try to push into the middle so they can be in the center. And um, so the horses can show you in the course of an hour and a half, the energetic shift that a group makes. So that's, that's one of the programs that I offer. Yeah. The regular one. <laughs> yeah. I saw that and I was like, that's cool. I want to do something like that. Um, and I love that you had spoke to the idea of when, yeah, I feel like so many people are so dead set on getting their horse to accept them and love them. And it really just highlights more of what about you? Like, how do you feel about yourself? What are you doing internally? What can you give instead of what I need from an outside source to make me feel um, good or complete or happy or whatever they're trying to achieve at the barn. So I love the idea of using them as a gauge of, you know, where you're at and how, you know, congruent you are with yourself when you step into their space. Um, it's funny. I have a mare who's super sensitive and she, as soon as I open the stall door, the, immediately the first thing she does is turn around and walk to the end and, they have a gate on the back side and the gate on the front. And I, if I'm just going to turn her out, I open up the gate. And so for a long time, I, I was just like, well, she wants to be, she thinks she's going out, you know, and, and I would stand there for a minute. And then I started to realize, well, she's not coming back over here. She's no, she's not being turned out. So what I started doing was just sitting in her stall door. I knew that I had to sit there because she wasn't coming near me until I was fully present and ready to actually be on board with what we were going to do. So I would just sit down in the, you know, the door of her stall and, you know, and talk to whoever was in the bar and I'll wait. And eventually she comes in and like, looks at me and is like, okay, I can come in now. And then she just stands there. So it's, it's so funny that even though like doing the work and being aware of, you know, what's going on, how, how complacent we can kind of get, throughout it as well and they're obvious always there to show me like that it's something that I need to be more aware of especially mine um and it is because they know me you know and my yeah. my my one gelding that I have um if he knows that I am wound up a little bit tight and I'm getting him ready he'll actually yawn before I ride and I feel like he's trying to actually release everything he can of his own to be able to take me on <laughs> because if I'm completely calm and I ride him, he usually yawns after and just relaxes. But if he's yawning before, I know that there's something that I'm bringing. It's like, he knows me yeah. so well and he's connected in that way that he's agreed at some level to take care of me in that way. When a lot of horses, I don't think will, but so it's just interesting to be aware of these things and go, Oh, okay. Sorry. Like, Sorry. <laughs> I, I see what you're trying to tell me. Okay. Yeah. I had, I've got two thoughts that I wanted to share on that. So I'm trying to remember them both. Um, uh, one of them uh, is about, you know, how you said that he can read you. And um, so I was working with a client one day and we did this, we were doing this little experiment where oh, she had some childhood trauma that she couldn't, remember but she felt it in her body and she had no cognitive memory of it except a, a suspicion and so i said mm -hmm. let's just test what your body knows so she mm -hmm. sat in a chair and i i stepped back about 20 feet and mm -hmm. i said i'm just going to casually walk towards you and when you feel uncomfortable because she's watching me, so not eyes closed or anything. And when you feel uncomfortable, just put your hand up in a stop sign and I'll step back and wait till you feel ready and then tell me to come forward. So I'm getting closer and closer. And she said, yeah, keep coming, keep coming. And I said, are you okay? She goes, yeah, no, I'm fine. And so now I'm like about two feet away, from, no, maybe three feet away from her. And one of my horses just walks in between the two of us and just, and, and just completely just dis, like just blocks us. And I'm trying to peek over the horse. Like, are you okay? And she said, no, I'm fine. I'm really fine. And I said, are you sure? And she said, yep. So I, <laughs> I did a no, no, which was I disregarded what my horse was saying. And I pushed her out of the way because you know, us humans, we know better not. And so I moved her out of the way 
And I took another step towards my client um, and she said, you could hit me over the head with a ton of bricks and I wouldn't feel a thing because I am not in my body now. And so the horse Mm -hmm. knew that her nervous system was at capacity and that the horse tried to Mm -hmm. stop us from continuing because the horse already knew that that's where she was at. So from that, the, the woman was okay because we... We just, you can get get her back into her body by just, you know, can you wiggle your toes? Can you feel your feet? You know, stand up, get some movement going. Yep, I'm back in. But um, at the moment, you know, she had disconnected from her body and the horses know that. They, they mm-hmm. can sense that. So I wanted to share that one. And um, also um, another thought I had when you were talking is that how good would it be if we could somehow have like a decompression chamber that we have to step into before we go into the horse's space, because in that space, that's where we have to gather all of our energies and our senses and our awareness and become present. And um, because, you know, like if we've had a busy day and then you go out to the horses late in the afternoon, so your energy scattered, you know, part of it's still thinking about what you're going to have for dinner and maybe, you know, the conversation that you had in the car on the way there and maybe, you know, something else that happened in the morning and what you're going to do later. And so energetically, we're just like fragmented. And um, I noticed that happening early, early on with my clients before I got them to do grounding. And the horses would just stand there like glazed over, like there was nobody standing in front of them. And I'd say to my clients, you know, like, so what are you noticing? And they said, I feel invisible. And mm-hmm. it occurred to me, well, that's because energetically, there's not enough of you present. That it's mm-hmm. not that you're invisible or, or, you know, that the horses, can't, you know, they can't really see you, but energetically, there's nothing there. There's not enough there for them to respond to. Mm-hmm. So by mm-hmm. going into this like decompression chamber first and doing that grounding and getting present and like just gathering back all of your awareness so you're in that moment and then engage with them then they can respond to us otherwise they're just dealing with like a hologram really you know you're not really there and and i think that's when um accidents happen too because we're not fully in our bodies the horses don't feel safe because like where are you i i can't i can't find you energetically you know you're too scattered i don't know how to respond i'm not safe and yeah so we we can inadvertently, you know, cause accidents for ourselves and others. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I'm always talking to my clients about having that mirrored back to us within either family members when we get home or coworkers or the barn or wherever we are, however we show up is what's going to show back up for us. And so I always talk about, well, before you get out of the car at the barn, you know, make sure you take a couple of breaths and how check in with how you actually feel so that you can have that as your own so that you don't get that bounce back to you. But it's just interesting, even doing the work, it's like now the discipline around it is not fine tuned, but the awareness is definitely there. <laughs> so first to have me, I'm like, hold on. Okay, wait. And I definitely get less triggered around it and my awareness is there. And then it's more of, okay, what is happening for me that's causing this? And it's allowed me to have a lot more empathy and a lot more grace for people. Um, just knowing that that piece is such a big part of it and going, oh, this is actually mine and how I respond to this is strictly from who I am and where I'm coming from. So being able to pause in between whatever you're doing and make sure that you're aware of what you're actually bringing um, is so big for them and everyone in your life. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's it. It's a good discipline to practice, you know, and I'm not particularly good at it myself is, you know, not (laughs) even though I do it like 10 times a day when, when I'm working with clients and then I get back into my life and I forget, (laughs) but it's, it is good discipline that, you know, when, when I do remember the dynamic changes, you know, when I'm interacting with groups or friends or family, when I remember to do those Mm -hmm. simple things of a quick grounding and just, just check in. How am I? Oh, I'm shitty. Oh, okay. <laughs> you don't even have to fix it. You know, it's just, yeah. just have to name it. And then, then it's like your body doesn't have to scream at you so loudly, you know, to get your attention. Like, yeah, you know, I'm agitated. I'm frustrated. I'm 
annoyed, it doesn't matter. Just name it, and then your body, you know, gives you some relief, and mm -hmm. and um, it changes the outcome of the interaction you have with others, whether it's family, work colleagues, mm -hmm. uh, courses. It's yeah. just a, you know, such a simple and profound practice to do. Yeah. And is there anything specific that you give your clients when they know, okay, I've owned this emotion and I know it's there. Is there a practice that you do with them that's consistent with all of them or does it really change pretty significantly between each of them as how they can actually resolve it and let that go? Yeah, there is. Um, I invite them to check in and where does that show up in your body? So mm. if you're agitated, you know, so you're agitated, what, what do you notice? How does your body respond to that? Mm -hmm. And usually it's going to be in the solar plexus, you know, that, that mm -hmm. gut area. So um, I invite them to not, um, not interpret, but just tune in and go, what is my body experiencing, you know, energetically? So mm -hmm. It feels tight. It feels heavy. It feels toxic. I feel like vomiting. It's like whatever, whatever comes up and just stay with that for like maybe two or three seconds and just name, you know, just describe it like be the scientist or the witness and just track how am I mm -hmm. feeling? Because if you go into it and you feel it and you name it, you're literally expressing it out of your body. Mm -hmm. So you're giving, you're helping your body release that, uncomfortable energy of that emotion so you don't have to solve it you don't i mean that will come later but initially you don't have to solve it you just need to help your body release it because everything's energy and our body energy wants to move and mm -hmm. some of these really heavy energies they can't move without our help and mm -hmm. our normal practice is to either avoid it or mm -hmm. you know stuff it down and and, you know, and just kind of work around it and you put it in the too hard pile. But the yeah. reality is that we abandon our bodies when we do that. And our bodies are like, well, you know, you, you just stuffed this stuff in me and now you're not going to help me get it out. Mm -hmm. So yeah. the way we help our bodies feel relief is just to tune in only for a couple of seconds. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it'll feel really uncomfortable. And then you need to shift your attention onto something else that's, positive excuse me <clears throat> so anything that that brings you some relief you know so it might be um getting up and getting a drink of water which is a good idea um, <laughs> and, <laughs> or it could be um uh just focusing on something that's that makes you feel happy mm -hmm. yeah um in that and, same workshop we kind of spoke to it's really about not judging the feeling that you're feeling, um, what we kind of started to do, you know, what's coming up for you. Um, when was the first time you felt it? And I feel like the resistance comes when it's made to be wrong. When someone tells you, Oh, you shouldn't feel that way. And then all of a sudden you're just being programmed. Oh, I feel that feeling that I'm not supposed to feel. And so let me stuff it. And I had this realization the other morning, I don't know, like a couple of days ago and I woke up and I was like, even asking my children the question or friends or whatever, what's wrong? Oh, you're upset. What's wrong? It's like, you're already been placing judgment in one emotion versus another. And I was like, I'm never going to ask that question again. Oh my gosh. Yes. But it's Good interesting once you become, mm -hmm, um, become of your language and what your, just that little hint of something could be wrong with the way you feel is so impactful for people because the moment we went through this process with a couple of them, when we traced it back to when, what was that thing and what actually happened without the emotion, what was actually happening. And, you know, my dad was driving me in a car and we were going here and I was like, but everything else, the story you had around it, can you see that it was a story that was created from some life experiences? And it was like, well, absolutely. You know, it was it wrong for you to feel that way. And it was like, no, and it was kind of just like holding that space to say it wasn't, I was a little kid, of course I felt that way, but without actually highlighting it and looking at it and holding space for that to be a thing, it can't be released because then it's just stuffed in your subconscious, kind of keeps poking back up. And um, 
And so I was like, well, how do you let somebody experience the feeling to completion to completely release it from your body without being in the grocery store and ripping like stuff off of the shelves and screaming at people, you know, I need to feel this feeling like a psycho and you're in you know, the jail. And, um, I had talked to my coach friend and she was like, what if we just witnessed the wounded self, whatever age it was in front of us and let them fully express that emotion in a non-judgmental space, you know, let it look like however it wanted to look like until it was done and it was gone and then send love to that part and let them reconnect. And I was like, okay. And we kind of experimented and it seems like after the few moments of just, I'm allowed to feel this way that people just lifted it. And it, it was like, Oh, you know, <laughs> like, Oh, and it was so interesting because it's so simple. Yeah. It's so profound in what it actually did for them. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, if we can hold curiosity, with that, you know, so not going into judgment, not going into fear, but just be curious. Oh, isn't that interesting? I'm feeling this in my body or that judgment just came up. Isn't that interesting? And right. just stay. If you, if you hold curiosity, you can't hold fear at the same time. And so, mm -hmm. you know, being afraid of the emotion and wanting to stuff it down. So, mm -hmm. so just being curious and the other part of that is to not stay in it for very long so it's mm -hmm. it's like um in my training we call it pendulating so you go into it and you feel it and mm -hmm. it's really uncomfortable and then you take yourself out so that your body settles and then you come back and it's like oh i can go a bit deeper a bit further uh, i've hit another layer feel it for a couple mm -hmm. of seconds come back out so you go in mm -hmm. and out because you don't want to traumatize your nervous system with too much intensity and so because mm -hmm. our bodies and our nervous systems are quite fragile so it's mm -hmm. just that gentle going in for a couple seconds and then coming out and each time you go in mm -hmm. and you honor whatever it is that you've experienced that emotion that story mm -hmm. just honoring it and being the witness you know being the observer feeling it mm -hmm. is is what you need to do to actually to clear it and to heal it so, but yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's in and out is the key, mm -hmm. particularly I'm mm -hmm. working with um, a number of people who are processing um, extreme grief. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and so, you know, grief is that, that emotion, that energy in your body, which just shuts everything down. So your body is literally, you know, dying because it's shut down. So you can't stay in grief for long because it's just too overwhelming for your, your biology. So it's the same process. You feel it for two or three seconds and then use, use whatever resource you have to take yourself out and, and think of something that, that counterbalances the emotion that you're experiencing. And then, as I said, each time you go in, you find that there's actually more space there's more capacity, more resilience, because you literally, you're clearing it from your right. body. And then yeah. the story starts to, you know, like you've got more room then for the story to come in and you've got more maybe compassion for yourself or for the other because, you know, you're not being activated. You know, that energy, it's this charge in your body. And, and so, you know, uh, we have a fight-flight response from that discomfort. So once that energy is cleared, you can be more objective and go, oh, okay, I see how that happened or I see how I did that or how that happened to me. And, you know, there's, a, there's an organic way that it just unfolds and then and closure happens more, more easily without forcing it, you know, mm -hmm. getting that energy out. And the other thing is that our bodies are always looking for an opportunity to complete it's defense response. And so um, anything mm. that, that happens to us that is a, is a threat to our survival. So it could be somebody being rude to us, you know, that could be a threat. And so we have a fight response as a response to that, or we want to run away from somebody because, you know, a fight flight response. And a lot of times we can't do that because it's inappropriate. You know, you mm -hmm. might be sitting in a business meeting and, and, um, you know, your supervisor says something which you get really offended by, 
you can't mm-hmm. you can't run out of the meeting or <laughs> <laughs> and so we it, so this, it's kind of a self sabotage because our biology says like the horses get out of here i don't feel safe mm-hmm. and, and that's our first response is to move away from and we sit there you know smiling or whatever and we've just betrayed ourselves and so mm-hmm. our bodies don't trust us because it's like you know you're putting us in a, in a threatening situation and you're not doing anything about it. And, you know, whereas if we were a horse, we wouldn't stay, we would leave. So we, our bodies are looking for opportunities to uh, complete the defense response. So energetically we attract similar circumstances over and over again, because the body wants a chance to either get away or to do the fight. So it wants to complete mm-hmm the, the right. defense response. So um, I don't know whether I mentioned this to you in our previous discussion, but my trauma training is based on um, wild animals and how they respond to life threats in their environment every day. And Dr. Peter Levine, who developed this model, um, questioned why is it that animals in the wild face these life-threatening circumstances and they, they don't get PTSD? What is it that they do differently to what we do? And whether they're humans or horses or wild animals, we all have the same response, that fight flight response. And there is a sequence. And one is that, you know, once you escape the threat, then your body needs to do the discharge, which is the shaking, and getting mm-hmm. rid of the adrenaline. And when that's done, the next, <clears throat> the next step in the sequence is that we reorient, so we look around, you know, coast is clear, and then we go back to grazing. And mm-hmm. if that sequence gets interrupted, so coming back to the, the meeting, if you're in a meeting and, you know, you've just been humiliated or whatever and you want to run and, you, and you're stuck there, then mm-hmm. that, that stress response didn't get completed. And so it stays in your body and your body says, well, I need to, recreate circumstances Mm -hmm. so that I can complete my defense response, which is maybe to run away. So Mm -hmm. often people will repeat over and over again Mm -hmm. a situation, which is why we may get into the same relationships. We find the same circumstances over and over because our bodies are wanting us to finish the defense response. I see. Oh yeah. That's, that's another good one. I'm going (laughs) to, I was like, oh, that's a good nugget. I'm going to take that one for sure. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, that's interesting. I've been thinking about when we have horses working the round pen and and allowing that space because the way I train, even though I don't actually take horses in training anymore, if I have a problem horse or something that comes in, that's where we go is I almost bring that piece when they're real shut down. I take them to that place almost. Like I put a lot of pressure on them and I get them there and then I stop immediately and I let them completely switch over nervous systems. And they do a lot of that. Well, they'll shake their whole body. They'll rub their face. They'll lip and chew. They'll yawn. And then all of a sudden they're like there, you know, and then we'll go the other way until that response, everything just turns into something that's much smoother and calmer, but they're present then. And I didn't actually know why I was doing that. It's actually, it wasn't, I think intuitively, I, I knew that this is how we get that piece out. I need to show them it's okay to be in that state because you can recover and nothing bad has happened. Like, let's get you back to the way your body knows how to regulate itself. Um, But I could never explain to people until now (laughs) why they needed to take their horse to that place. Yeah, that's really cool. Okay, good. And and, and, and (laughs) that's, that's really cool. And what, what you're also doing is you're rewriting a program. So mm-hmm. they have a program that says, um, if this happens, I'm going to be in danger. You know, I'm, so it's kind of like that PTSD thing where we get stuck and then we hear a loud noise and we get jumpy because our bodies are saying loud noises are bad, you know, loud noises are danger. And so same thing with the horses. If they've had an experience, they have a reaction. And Mm -hmm. because they haven't completed their defense response. And when you take them back to that point Mm -hmm. and you're giving them the opportunity to complete the defense response, they're actually rewriting this program in their brain, just like with us, Mm -hmm. that the, that 
uh, there's different levels of memory and there's the, the memory of, you know, the facts, of what actually happened. And then there's another memory and it's kind of like when you ride a bike, you know, your body knows how to ride it without you telling it, your feet to push pedals. And mm -hmm. so that's the memory we're getting to. And when you get to that memory and mm -hmm. it gets upgraded or updated and it says, oh, I took care of myself, you know, mm -hmm. that event happened and I was able to execute a defense response that kept me safe. And so mm -hmm. now it, it's, I, I, I feel like it's over. And so when you get a horse to do that, the next time it has a similar uh, trigger, I'm, I'm guessing that your yeah. ho that horse won't respond the same way anymore because you've up upgraded that program, that memory program that says that that danger is no longer a danger anymore. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Yeah. yeah, cool. I'm glad I know how to explain it to people. <laughs> I just know I kept saying, no more up. Like, like if they spook, like get, you know, and because people see their horses so calm but then when something comes out of nowhere, the horse spooks and explodes. And I'm like, he's just stuffing it. You know, he needs to actually go through the entire process. And it's a lot of standing, you know, when you go that up and then you have to stop and they're in the height, their tails flipped up and they're snorting and then you get completely still and have to be able to regulate your own nervous system and just stand there and let it be what it is for them. Then they come down, but the standing is what gets to people a little bit. They're like, well, we're just standing here. I don't understand. I'm like, that's where the magic happens, you know, and that's where yeah. you get to spend the time to practice that for yourself too. When you get into these uncertain situations and how do you keep yourself calm and how do you keep yourself regulated? And it's a good time to practice yeah. that. And that standing is when the, the body is sending a message to the brain that says new information. I need to update that program now. So it's really important to do that standing and, and let that processing happen mm -hmm. and, and also helping, you know, just notice it if, if you want, but you know, when, when that processing is done, the horse is going to do this. It's just going to look around and mm -hmm. that completes, that's the final step and you want that horse to look around. And that's another thing that I do with my clients before they go in with, with the horses, I, I invite them to turn your head and look around notice what's happening in your environment because that's your body is, is making a decision. How safe mm -hmm. am I? Is my environment safe? I'm resetting my nervous system so that I can go back to grazing. So that's, that's an important piece in that changing that horse's, you know, or completing that defense response. So the horse is back to normal because in the wild, mm -hmm. if they don't do that, then they would be somebody's dinner because they're in that hyper state and they're not reading the environment accurately and they're putting themselves in danger. Mm -hmm. So it's cool. <laughs> yeah. And it's interesting to see that one of the things that I shifted was there are so many trainers that are so focused and I was like this for a long time. Make sure your horse is paying attention to you. Oh, they look away, get their attention, get their attention. And I had kind of shifted and said, we're looking around, let them look around. You know, the response of if I move and they look back at me, I know they're still connected, but don't take away the one thing that's going to allow them to relax and be confident and safe. It's they're assessing what's going on. Just it's fine. Um, but it's so it's so opposite of what traditional training kind of tells you to do. So kind of it's interesting. interesting. Yeah, because I was just working with an equestrian this morning and I was talking to her about, you know, when you're leading a horse, not to not to hold them so tightly, but let them let them look around because that act of looking around literally calms their nervous system down because they can go, oh, yeah, that's what's happening. Yeah, I'm safe. But if, if they're not allowed to look, imagine what it would feel like for us if we could sense that there was something happening just beyond, you know, our, you know, our ability to see it. And we could sense it like, you know, it's going to make you more reactive because right. you know there's something going on, but you can't look at it. To, to assess it. Yeah. And you know, another thing we do when, um, when we go to a cafe, we step into the space. And the first thing we do is we turn our heads and we look around. And not just because we're looking for a place to sit and a safe place to sit, but we're sending a message to the brain that says, I've got to shift from my, my sympathetic stress response to my parasympathetic response so that, you know, the parasympathetic is the rest and digest response. So when I turn my head 
I'm sending a message to the brain. Coast is clear. I have to shift gears so that I can graze, so that I can, I can absorb the nutrients of the food that I eat. So we can't, we can't absorb nutrients when we're in that active stress response. We need to be in the parasympathetic. So we do it naturally. We turn our heads, you know, when we're going into a restaurant, yeah, looking around and there's more to it than just looking at a table. It's, we're working with our biology to say, okay, time to down regulate. Mm -hmm. And so what I teach my clients is that do that frequently throughout the day. Whenever you go to the supermarket, you get out of the car, stop, look around what's happening in my environment and then walk mm -hmm. in through the doors. And before you grab a basket, you know, just look around and then like, just take one second or two seconds. That's all it takes. But mm -hmm. if you, if we do that throughout the day, then our bodies at the end of the day, we have less anxiety that we've accumulated because we're allowing our bodies to do what they're designed to do, you know, is to sense into the environment and, and determine how safe we are from one moment to the next. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. I love that. <laughs> I could literally talk to you forever. I think we've been talking for almost an hour and a half now. <laughs> so oh, wow. in respect to time, we'll, we'll wrap up, but is there any programs that you have coming in that you want to speak to or is there anything that's come up that you feel like you want to say um before we wrap up so that you're not like oh i really wanted to say i always want to check in with people to make sure that they've gotten everything they wanted to say out um i i think we've covered a lot so there's probably <laughs> yeah. not, not much left in me <laughs> um i've just moved to a new property and and um we're setting it up so it's more purpose built for the kind of work we do. And mm -hmm. in the next couple of months, I'd like to be offering uh, different programs and retreats. And one of the retreats that um, I'm, I've got that I've been wanting to like bring to uh, fruition for quite a while is um, um, a lot of my clients and a lot of the women that I work with all have a, a similar that you know it's a variation on a theme which is always around not always but seems to be around um, not being able to speak up staying small you know looking after everyone else and then I'm okay you know like I'm you know I'll I don't take care of me but I take care of you and so there's a there's quite a you know, like nearly everyone I know has a degree of that and mm -hmm. so it occurred to me that we're actually um, descendants of the women that were persecuted, you know, in recent centuries and burnt at the stake and stoned to death. And, um, you know, all those horrible things got hung, you know, for being witches. And, you know, we, we are all their descendants. And so we carry that ancestral trauma and neuroscience is catching up and is, has, you know, more has proven that we carry, um, you know, the traumas from past generations until you know till we actually address it and and heal it so i'm um, anxious to put together this retreat around healing that ancestral wound and um you know working with the horses that have that divine feminine energy about them and and going a little bit you know feral with our fire ceremonies and doing uh, some cool stuff as well as doing the mm -hmm the hard work of, of healing that ancestral trauma. So that's one of, one of the retreats that, that um, I'm really keen to offer. And um, we had a number of other programs that um, I'm working on. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them are around how to, how to honor and process grief and, and move it through your body in a, in a way that's quick and easeful so that, you know, uh, you can, enjoy your, you know, the, the vitality of life and, and, and honor and respect, you know, the, the one who's passed. And so there's, since there seems to be a lot of grief that's surfacing for a lot of people at the moment and working with people on and teaching them how their nervous systems are supposed to work and how we can work with our nervous system to, to uh, come back to this equilibrium, like the horses, you know, bite somebody on the bum, go back to grazing, you know, it's all over. <laughs> so we need to get better at doing that. So there's a few programs like that and retreats that, that are coming up when our 
our premises is finished and that probably will be in the next couple of months. Oh, so, very cool. Yeah. It'd give me a good reason to go to Australia. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That'd be fun. Yes. Well, thank you so much for spending the time with us. Literally the most profound things have come to me through our very small amount of conversations that we've had. So you have really helped me see things in a much different way. And I'm sure people hearing it from you are going to gain so much insight and just a different perspective and how, um, how much more power we do have over our experience, you know, with our horses and with our own, our own life. <laughs> so thank you so much. I really appreciate the work you're doing. And, you know, and I just want to honor that because it's, I don't think there's a lot of people doing it, but I think that there is a shift even within the horse industry of the training side of it that's shifting. So kind of fun to find other people that are on the same page and have these conversations. Thanks, Amber. And, and um, I'm really impressed with uh, the work that you're doing and that pioneering that you're doing in terms, especially around, you know, pushing horses into that, that space where they're, they've met their trauma and they have that moment where they can have a different outcome and, and um, how aligned that is with what, you know, the teachings of neuroscience and what, you know, we're learning in our, in our trauma work. So that's, that's really cool that you came across it on your own. And, and um, <laughs> well, yeah, I got a little bit of validation around it. Now I can explain it better. <laughs> yeah, no, it's sometimes it helps to have some of that language around it. But um, well done. And um, yeah, that's cool. And yeah, thank you for your time. Yeah, thank you. And we'll, we'll definitely chat again, I'm sure. So you have yeah. a beautiful rest of your day. Thanks. <laughs> you too. Bye. Okay. Bye.